All right, these are the rags that we tie the meat into after it's been salted. You can see it has a stain from the smoke process. And so these cloths are from the pork that we've already pulled down and eaten. And I just pulled this one out of the smokehouse. It has been salt cured and smoked and it's been hanging out there for about a month, maybe. Three weeks, you think? Yeah, we haven't been too long, but long enough. And it's cool on, on the smokehouse, to, so even on a warm day, it stays good. Yeah, there's enough airflow, enough air circulation that it stays cool in there, and you can see that it is still, even now, drying out. guys so today I wanted to talk about how I learned to butcher how I learned to do it well so that I was doing it quickly safely the meat was good and the way that I did that was going to a class by Brandon Sheard and I have quite a bit of footage that I took at the time that I had permission from him to show on my YouTube channel so I'm gonna take all that old footage that looks so terrible and it's so old and grainy, but I'm gonna show you a little bit of it so you kind of see what it is that he teaches. We went to the class as observers. You could have gone to the class as a participant or you could actually hire him to come in and butcher your animal for you. But that's a way that you can actually have your animal butchered for free is to have a class where you pay him to come in and then you charge people to come and be part of the class. So it's pretty cool. Gun. There was the result of uh, long ago when they brought pigs to the East Coast from Europe, they would keep them on the islands in the Mississippi River. And so they would create isolated populations. And one of those islands developed this mutation, one toe. So with genetics that old, this means that this pig is totally different. Well, largely different than a lot of the pigs that we eat at the supermarket. Um, those pigs are, they're genetically developed post, the, after the invention of refrigeration. Um, this guy, his genetics are before that, so he is designed to be preserved without refrigerant, without a freezer. That means he's going to have a lot of fat, a lot. And even the kind of fat that he has is not going to have a lot of water in it because water leads to spoilers. And when you cure pork, you're just removing water. And so he's already, he'll be 99% cured right after you cook it. Yeah. He's, he's pretty close. We just have to not mess it up. Just add salt and don't mess it up. Um, so he's kind of a cool guy in that respect. And that means that uh, he is ideal for, I think, for the home kitchen. This is a pig for the home kitchen, not for mass production. Um, he's smaller, he's more efficient, he's, he's going to have a lighter demand on your property than a larger like Yorkshire pig would. Uh, he, he contributes to good kitchen economy, because when you cure the whole pig, you actually eat less pork, because it tastes stronger and it's concentrated. And by cured, I mean stuff like bacon and ham. <coughs> And so today, that's, that's going to be the style for the next two days, is this is home scale. And uh, the equipment is therefore really simple. Um, this is doing it, you know, once or twice a year, you know, no more than eight pigs. The equipment that we have today will enable you to do that. And we just have a 55-gallon drum, a chain hoist, a gambrel that we'll hang them on, and a really spanking propane burner, which is essential. Um, a 22 rifle and some knives and cutting boards and salt. And that's, that's pretty much all you need to create bacon and ham better than anything you can purchase in this country. Um, the stuff that you make on your own will be extravagantly delicious. Just because it's simple, 
just because you're starting with healthy food. Industrial pay it for it. even the nice stuff, you know, if you're paying more for organic. Their head is just a constant moving target, you know, because they're rooting and they're way down low. So I think pigs are the hardest livestock to dispatch mainly, which is one bullet. Cows are easy, you know. If we had a cow in here, I could bench rest on the gate and she would just stand. <laughs> Always, basically, every time. And they'll just stand there. He will never do that. Um, he, right? Um, so, strategy. I like to deny them food and water because the one time they do not move their head is when they're drinking. They just put their head down and they slurp. They don't laugh like a dog. Hold completely still. That's the only time. So, water is probably the best way. I also like to deny them food because you can kind of know the general vicinity of where their head will be. You know, if you put the food there, I know he'll be around here somewhere. And so I can kind of set up and take my time, which is the second key is patience. You don't have to be an excellent marksman. You should obviously know how to operate your gun. But, um, in any case, is to be patient, and I always have another round in my pocket. But the target I'm aiming for is not right between the eyes. Um, they will catch a bullet there. I've seen things catch a 308. Um, and just walk away and keep moving. Uh, so it's an inch and a half to two inches above the level of the eyes. And some people visualize an X between the eyes and the ears, and that's too complex for my brain. So I just, you know, above the level of the eyes on the forehead. That's what you're looking at. So I think we'll get started. Uh, TJ, you've got the blood catchment apparatus, and you've got the milk. So I'm going to start by trying to shoot in that direction. Yeah. But no, they're not all like this. It's also an old breed for things. Because they used to raise pigs, not to be raised in an industrial setting, but in the backyard with little kids. With the families. Yeah. So even they, they genetically select boars to be nice. You know? <laughs> stab him actually right here and make a small hole to cut his carotid arteries and his heart is going to continue to pump even after his brain has been taken out by the bullet and he'll convulse for a little bit they all convulse differently um, and he'll just be pumping blood out and then we'll take the pig to our barrel and we'll hoist him up and we're going to dip him half in at a time to scald him and when he comes up out of the water, we're going to scrape his hair and his black skin off, which I think is technically his epidermis. So his dermis will still be on. Um, he'll be pink if we do it right. Um, and doing it right is no simple thing. Scalding and scraping a pig is incredibly arduous and messy. You get hair, mud, and whatever else he's been living in all over you in every orifice in your body. And... Uh, but it is the key to nose to tail eating. It is, if you don't scald and scrape a cake, you can't eat the whole cake. You lose not only all the skin, which is cracklings, which is ridiculously delicious, but you lose the head, all four feet, because you're not gonna, the chances that you're gonna pull a hairy pig head out of your refrigerator tomorrow and, you know, clean it is, it's just not gonna happen. Um, so, if we, getting the scald and scrape, Right, it's essential. Because then he will look like food. He'll be clean. He'll just be this big, beautiful, he'll look like a big sausage. His head will be clean. We're going to scald right around his eyes, his ears, everything. It's the key to eating everything on him. And incidentally, it is the key to retaining the back fat. Um, I promise I'm going to stop talking so I get going. But uh, the back fat on a pig is the only fat in the cosmos, it does not turn into paste when you put it through a meat grinder. All other fat kind of turns into mush and it emulsifies a lot. So you know when you get a salami and you get do a cross cut of it and you see the little white chunks? That's back fat. Only back fat stays in chunks like that. Only pigs have back fat. Only pigs that have been scalded and scraped have back fat. Um, so to skin a pig is just totally 
blasphemous. <laughs> You're like taking away this unique fact that only they have. Um, I ask you a question. Yeah, so yeah. now most butchers they just skin them. Out. They, only, they, 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 they you take them anywhere, butcher. They slaughter them. They skin them, and that's and that's pretty much it. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, and they lose as a result from this weight. No, not even from this weight. Of hanging weight, which is without the guts, when you scald, when you skin a pig, you lose, and by the time you get the wrapped cuts, after all that's in, you get maybe 50% of hanging weight. And half. The way we're going to do it today, through the scalding and scraping, and then tomorrow, it's a, you get the whole pig back, 100% of hanging weight. Which should be obvious, but you know, it's like, the, the industry has been uh, of even small scale pig processing, you know, if you're raising two or three a year or whatever and you take them to the butcher, he's gonna process them how Tyson processes at the rate of a thousand pigs a day, which is totally nonsense, it makes no sense, but that's the industry standard, which involves, you get back maybe the yield is 50% of the Um You know, our definition of meat is uh, skeletal muscle, mm -hmm. but that's there's a lot more than that on an animal. Um, there's mm -hmm. tendon, there's skin, lots of fascia, and there's fat, especially there's fat. <laughs> there's a specific fat that you want for lard in there. Yeah, it's it's in it's in the body cavity around the kidneys, the leaf fat. So that'll all be lard. It's just white. Yeah, it's the purest. It doesn't taste like pork. It's, uh, you use it for baking. It's the original shortening. Everything else is a bastard shortening. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, Crisco is a bastard shortening. What would you feed a pig if it weren't going to turn out as much fat as muscle? The same thing. Yeah, you mean like a pig that's uh, not a fat breed like this? Sure. Is that what you mean? Yeah. Yeah, like, it would be the same thing because... Oh, the same thing being not corn and soy. Okay. Yeah, pretty much any other grain besides corn and, and so soy. So just because of the breed that it is, it puts on that much fat to muscle. Exactly. And other breeds is what you were talking about. Other breeds don't. I like the fatty pig. I love this. Because I like to cure most of my pork. I don't put any of it in the freezer. Um, other breeds are that are not as fat, there's really only three. It's Yorkshire, Duroc, and Hampshire. And those were developed more recently for people that preferred the lean meat. Yeah. You can tell physiologically looking at a pig if it's a large pig or if it's a lean pig. There used to be a large type and a meat type for every breed, even Yorkshire and Hampshire. Um, large pigs are shaped like this, um, which is really distinct. We had another tell, but the Yorkshire during the Hampshire, the meat pigs, have an hourglass shape. She's got it a little bit, but their shoulders are wide well, and their like butts are like, wide. They look like a person on all fours. They look like a pit bull. Yeah. Mm -hmm. They're really wide and then they're thin in the middle. And you can see musculature. He's the opposite. He's got narrow little hips and narrow shoulders and he's wide in the middle and his back is arched because it's highly fat. Resting against the barrel down here, 
So I think about straightening up the spine. It's actually quite a vigorous hango that you do. Push his hip forward and push his belly lower here, back, so that he's shaking his butt down there. You know what I mean? Yeah, you got to keep it moving. Yeah, that'd be cool. Don't let me take away the present. Yeah, so as he's coming out, we're going to be scraping like crazy. Yeah, I think usually it's two. Okay. As you'll see, as we scrape, you can really only fit three people around the pig sure. scraping. And then we start scraping all well, until it's okay. Yeah, I really want to know what you want to harvest. You know, we want to get really ambitious and clean intestines for sausage casings and get head cheese started right away. And you actually want to try to eat the whole entire animal that you can't have them. So, I usually like to just give it a little test at the three minute mark. Oh, that's a good sign. If you raise it up a little bit. Oh. Wow. That's pretty sweet. Yeah, that's awesome. Yeah, that's awesome. Those scrapers are good. I'm getting pulled out. That pigmented black layer of yep. skin with the scrapers. It's called the skirt. And that's what tastes yeah, nasty. Are you going on this? Yeah. Yeah, if anybody else wants to try it. Yeah, yeah if your arms get tired, pass it on. Shave them off. Shave them. I avoid burning because I always taste burnt hair. Later on. Not a good flavor. No. Or a good smell. Really. No. So I just, even if it leaves, you know, follicles in the skin, it doesn't matter. It's better. So this is what turns into crackling or chicharrones. Mm -hmm. uh, this is also, incidentally, you know, there's a whole nitrite debate uh, pertaining to making salami in particular, which is the aged sausage that you slice in and eat raw. Uh, they used to make it without synthetic nitrite. They had salts that had an impurity of nitrate in it, just naturally. Um, but you only prevent botulism with nitrite. And so today, you, you're you required to add it as a synthetic compound, which kind of makes all salami taste sour and tangy. It's like, all taste the same, doesn't matter what you put in it. If, on the other hand, you do it the old school way, you raise a pig with, that's an older breed, and it's really healthy, he has lots of pigment in his flesh, that pigment, myoglobin, naturally converts nitrate to nitrite. In this skin, there's even though we scalded it, there is bacteria on the skin, Staphylococcus and Microcosmic bacteria, that naturally convert nitrate to nitrate. So, you have to not only raise it right, but slaughter it right, right to do things the old way. Straight down, rather than into your gut. That can be, uh, not so good for your gut. <laughs> So you can see how we've got you know some black streaks left. It's not necessary to get it off, but it's kind of rewarding. And the best way to get it off is with a Scotch Brite sponge. You just keep it wet and you scrub it, and you can you can get them totally completely white. Oh, that's black green scrubbing. Yeah, with the green side. Yeah, it just came right off. Yeah. It's not essential, but it, you know, it is really cool to get a black pig absolutely white. All right, so then I've got uh, the knives here we're shaving, and what we'll do, I put a pretty acute edge on these, so they work best when you hold them like this, you know. Not straight up. Hold them down like that. And you can, when you have it at that acute of an angle, you can actually kind of press pretty hard without cutting into the meat. Um, this, just doing that, won't work as well at all. Yep. So we'll shave everything.
and then with this guy. Oh, beautiful. Let's see. Yeah. <laughs> A really <laughs> cute angle, and you can actually press pretty hard. Yeah, like that yeah. replacement is my angle, you know, <laughs> without worrying about uh, cutting. Full shave. Now get the dance in the match. I'll send it to the camera. It's just harder to scrape because it's curved and not a flat surface. <laughs> What I do is TJ, you go like this, back and forth. Yeah. And I kind of sort of push on the guts, yeah. push this way at the same time, so that it brings those trotters off of the barrel. Yeah, maybe. There's my stick. Oh, yeah, photo. And then, uh, yeah, we're going to go And we're cutting this up right behind the ears. So just oh, make sure fun. with your knife you want to carry it right behind the ears like that. Off that, and it's it's a big sack that surrounds all the guts inside the pig, and it's got a it's attached to the spleen here. Isn't I watched one of those an Iron Chef once? There's some famous dish you cook inside the you like wrap the yeah whatever in the call fat and then cook it. Yeah, yeah, everything. Um, <laughs> put anything in the call fat and call it good. Absolutely, it's just a web of fat, you know. So whatever, whatever you can think of that needs a little pork fat, which you know, what doesn't? <laughs> like I wrap, I wrap turkeys in it. Yeah, I think that's Barbecue the turkeys. Wrap a chicken in it, roast a turkey. Wrap a leg of lamb in it, roast a leg of lamb. Wrap little balls of sausage in it, bake that. Is it for your pate recipe? Yeah. you have on, on your website. Right. This is yeah, and the pate recipe, which is just basically a meatloaf, you know, in a terrine. But before you put the meatloaf mix in with the liver and pistachios and brandy, you just lay the call fat in, the loaf pan, and then you put the meat mix in, and then you fold the call fat over the top, and you pop it in the oven. So whatever you can think of to use it for is the proper use of it. It just bases. Donuts? Yeah. Donuts sounds awesome. Incidentally, the best donuts you'll ever have are donuts that are deep fried in leaf fat or tallow. Which is better. <laughs> tallow is the internal body fat of uh, cows that has been rendered. It's what McDonald's french fries used to be fried in. There's the call fat, and it's really big. It's folded over on itself several times right now, so you can't quite see it. But it's just a beautiful lace network of fat. And uh, fortunately, at least I, for my brain, there's no ratio, there's no recipe for, you know, this many pounds of meat means you need this much salt, means you need this many days on the salt before you rinse it off. There's no ratio or recipe. It's much better to focus on what you are doing when you're curing, which is drying it out. To cure, to make bacon, you're just pulling water out. That's it. You're using salt to pull it out through osmosis. And so it's done when it's not wet anymore. <laughs> and then it will keep literally until the end of the cosmos or until you eat it first. Usually the latter comes first. Um, so, yeah, it's very simple. And we'll focus on the basic process. And that's how you make prosciutto, guanciale, pancetta, bacon. It's all the same. The only difference is where it comes from on the pig. But the process is identical. Interesting. Yeah. And that's why recipes mystify that. They make you think that they're very different things. But they're not at all. You just need to have a basic understanding of the process. Which so if you don't use enough salt, though, you risk letting it stay moist way too long, or yeah. Okay. And fortunately, if it does, if it doesn't work for you, which by the way, that's never happened to me or anyone else <laughs> that I know who I have instructed on how to cure this. But um, but you know it. There is no question. You're never going to come to a piece of meat hanging in your kitchen and go, oh, I don't know. Never. <laughs> you will know. Objectively, and with whole meat cures, botulism is not a problem. It's exactly, anaerobic, so it's, yeah. there's no chance for it to set up on the surface. Yeah, and we'll talk about Salami's this more too. Yeah, salami is a totally different thing, and we'll get into all the differences and 
In general, you want to, because of that, uh, encourage draftiness and airflow and a generally dryish environment, not too humid, which you guys have no problem with out here. The other thing that might happen is uh, if you're hanging in a place where there's lots of light, the fat will start to oxidize a little bit, even on a saturated fat pig, it'll get a little yellow. Um, you can see we're getting lots of water coming off the meat already. You can see how it run. Oh, yeah, it's still pretty nice. Pork chops make sense with pigs. Everything makes sense with pigs. <laughs> So this is one way. Um, there's another way to pull, to kind of manage water inside of meat, and that's brining. And that's just dissolving this in cider or water, maybe to also dissolving some sugar or honey in there, um, and submerging the piece in that brine. And uh, it's you can keep things in the brine, like you would keep them in your refrigerator, if it's more salty, things will keep longer in your brine and they'll just get saltier and saltier and absorb more of that flavor. Because brine, again, in that environment, there's an immediate exchange. Salt is immediately going into the meat. So anything you put in the brine is pretty certainly going to be salty unless you really time how long it's in there and you pull it out before um, it gets real salty. And you can take it out, dry it, and I like to cold smoke things in brines because that dries them off a lot. And then you can hang it. Um, if you were just to take it out sopping wet from the brine and just hang it without the drying cold smoking step, it would be a little moist and it would probably attract flies. You might get molds and it might spoil. So you'd want to do something to enhance that drying. And cold smoking, by the way, does not have to be a complex operation. It's a very simple thing. Um, I like to use a real actual source of burning wood because that dehydrates air, you know, it pulls moisture out of the air. You guys don't have to worry about that here. But, uh, and then I, I do it with a Weber barbecue, a cheap one, you know, just a little egg shaped thing. And I pull all the grills out and I put hardwood in there, and I ignite it, and I put the lid on cracked, and then I hang my meat from my eave in my house. And the smoke just goes up to the meat. That's it. It's just smoke wafting on meat. It's all cold smoke. And it is, it works really well. It's so easy. And it usually takes a couple afternoons. If I were to sit there all day and, you know, keep the fire going, then it would probably take just a day to get a nice golden smoke on it. Um, but it does not have to be in uh, an expensive chamber or anything like that. What I actually prefer, a more drafty smoking environment, because we're not adding nitrate or nitrite to this. Well, we probably are adding nitrate, but not trite. Um, we, you kind of want, you don't want to have an anaerobic environment, which a smoker can be. It can be an oxygen-free environment. If it's totally sealed, you shut the door and then you fill it with smoke, there's a chance there's not going to be any oxygen in there. So if there is a risk of some nasty bottles and toxins being released, at any point in the dry curing stage, it would happen in a cold smoker that's airtight. So that's why I like to have a draft. You just need some slats. Summer when it's you know 80 degrees in my house and it stays there all winter when the wood stove is blasting not more than seven yards away or three yards away or something. So that's what that second side will be all about. Um, it is how you create prosciutto, guanciale, and cheddar, bacon, all these fancy things that generally you only find in expensive restaurants, but really they are. They're survival food, they're peasant food. That's how you preserve food so you don't starve during the winter. Um, not only do you not starve, you thrive because it's really delicious. And it's incredibly fatty. And I've gotten to the point where when we get a pig in for my family, I can't, I, I do like pork chops and I like Boston shoulder roast and everything, pulled pork is awesome. But given the choice, I cure everything. None of it makes it into the freezer. Uh, it really is that good. It tastes so good. It... The quartering is not arbitrary. It falls a logic. And I think that, that logic is the key to meat cooking 
that would forever wean you from dependence on recipes. You don't need that. I only know three recipes, or three methods of cooking meat. Braising, pan frying, and roasting. And that's all you need. Because this is about cookery. Butchery serves cookery, not the deli case, not commodity. If we can cook this at the end of the day, if you can't remember what is a Boston butt and a picnic shoulder, it doesn't matter. You will have butchered correctly if you can cook it well. So braising, pan frying, and roasting. Braising. So it's wet, low, and slow, hot and fast, and then application of dry heat and roasting. That's all you need. Every single ounce of meat on this can be cooked with one of those three methods, or maybe even a combination. So how do you determine what to cook? With what method? You have to know what is tough and tender and what is fat and lean. So what is tough or tender is a result of the function of that muscle, because we're eating skeletal muscle, right? So how do you know if it's tough or tender? Well, you could deduce just by looking at this, which muscles will be tough? You've got all of this right here articulating this leg. And you've got all of these muscles here holding the heavy head and articulating this front leg. So every time this guy takes a step, he's using these muscles. Apart from starting with a good healthy pig, you know, obvi obviously that. But really, truly, if all we do, which we should do, just to prove this, is that uh, if you salt it properly and there's enough fat, it will be delicious. If you do not salt it enough and it's too lean, no matter how many fancy spices or funky recipes you, you know, unearth, you cannot fix it. It is un unredeemable unless you add more fat or more salt. And so what I do, the only thing I measure when I make sausage is salt. Um, I don't even, you know, separate the lean and the fat and measure that out. I can just look at this and know, yeah, we've got plenty of that. We're doing pretty good on that the fat That looks pretty fatty. <laughs> You could be up to 50% fat. It'll be awesome. If you, what happens if you put in too much fat? It just melts. Too turns. much of a good thing is a good thing. Yeah. yeah <laughs> it doesn't just <laughs> turn into like a liquid blob. You know, something. if you're not going to stuff it into casings, it would. Yeah. You know, if you just have little patties, it would do that. But casings is just like simmering in its own fat. It's a beautiful thing. So what I do is, if, if you're starting with a good pig, just pull your sausage meat from the shoulder and the sirloin. Because both of those sections have at least 30% fat, which is what you want. At least that much. Um, and then I salt one a teaspoon, a teaspoon and a quarter per pound of meat. And that, that's it. So need, a teaspoon and a quarter per pound of meat. Um, so it's proper salt, proper fat. Done. That's all we did. It would be an extravagantly delicious sauce. We say of meat, of meat, fat, combined. Yeah, stuff. right. Exactly. Mass. So it's the whole mass. Yeah. So this just kind of there's a membrane here, just peeling back. Yeah. Sort of follow the seams, but you're also kind of just carving a tube. And I come all the way down to the shoulder blade, which is right there. There it is. So that's kind of your, your lines right there. Am I going to go all the way off? No. The fat, or am I just going to come we're around gonna, and take some of the fat? And none, none well, of the we're going to try to not take any of the fat. Nowadays, yeah, it's it's like it wasn't even cured. Exactly. Because it's there's there's really nothing there. I mean, I cook yeah. it and I get and it's so thin yeah. and it's just. A little ribbon of meat, yeah. and then any of the white just turned to water and, yeah. and disappears, and yeah. and it just doesn't taste good. Yeah, that's, it's just not. that's definitely the unsaturated thing and the process. So if it has an expiration date on it, or says refrigerate or freeze, it is not bacon. It's not cured. It's not preserved. Yeah. I mean, isn't that just yeah. like you get a slab of that and throw it on it? Oh, God. <laughs> Holy <laughs> man, that is a oh. All right, so let's keep quartering. Come up here. Yeah. Get, a, get a picture of this edge with all that meat and fat. And, oh. So th this, that's how you do it on all quadrupeds. That's how you take the back leg off. Now for the shoulder, we've got the leg, belly, loin, and shoulder. The shoulder, a lot of guys count ribs. I prefer just to go to the end of the sternum. 
the, the brisket and the sternum is right here on the bottom of the ribs. And so I go to the end, just mark it out with the knife, and it ends in this cartilaginous tip. And I just kind of go right to the end of that tip, and that happens to land me up in between these two ribs here. So I'll just draw a line as straight as possible, right between those two ribs that goes right into that disc, and then straight out again. <coughs> So it'll be the same exact process. You go down with the knife in between those ribs, long drawing strokes, and then come up there and do the same thing. Because again, it's just a little pinky of bone that's holding this vertebra to that. There's no bone, other bone connection there. And we'll be quartering yours at the same way. Yeah. And we'll, we'll still be able to get it all. Yeah, and you're cutting through the little soft bone tips of the uh, ribs there at the end, which is great. This is very dense fat. We had an example of a Unsaturated fat. Yeah, so it's totally dense. Well. It would be very greasy, right? It'd, It'd be very, very greasy. greasy. Start being greasy. There'd be puddled water on the table already. Okay. And most of that is the way they're fed and the Yeah, it's both. Yeah. We were saying before, though, if you can only find the breeds that don't put on this kind of fat. Um, you can go a long way to creating a really excellent pig just by feeding it, right? So even if you can only find your Kikura from the if you don't feed it corn and soy, it'll, be, it'll still be an awesome pig. Can you do the backside? Yeah, if you can see that. Okay. This one seems heavier. Is that all of it? Yeah, it's both. It's genetics and feed again. The Pata Negra are good. Right. And it's done. Right. That is not. Very good. 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 Very good.